that is delightful. Welcome to our Tuesday session where we talk about random things that are impacting the higher education sector and ways that that's being influenced, obviously, by some of the current crisis that we're facing. One of the first things I just want to kick off with is uh, some of you were here last week when we had uh, the experience of being Zoom bombed. And since that time, that's only got more prominent in terms of the tension and recognition. Uh, I just read this morning a University of Texas at Austin incident where the president has now called a special committee to investigate Zoom bombing, which is kind of like saying, why? Like, here's, here's what Zoom bombing is. Dickheads have power that they use in inappropriate ways. That's the Zoom bombing equation. And it doesn't matter how much you investigate, the, the, you're going to get no practical, discernible results out of it. The issue here relies 100% on Zoom. Zoom has been a disaster in how it's responded to this. I've seen some of their articles. It's like, read this blog post with 78 external links, each one of them with 12 different click button thingies that you have to do in order for your Zoom room to be safe. It really should be click a button, shut everybody the hell up, take away their mic, take away their, their everything, and you talk. Like, that's what Zoom should do. Now, I know they're trying to get their act together on this and make it easier, but really it gets to the reality of designing what's a really good technical system, but completely ignoring uh, some of the security constraints of individuals. And I don't care how many university presidents hold special committees to investigate Zoom bombing, you're going to find nothing out about it. That's like saying there was a mean person to me on 4chan or on Reddit or on Twitter. I would like an investigation. I don't know. What's your reading? Well, I mean, it, it is it, it is exciting that the university presidents are finally going to learn that 4chan used to exist, um, and that there are a number of people out there who have been trying to interject themselves into the online discourse since 2014 ish, at least overtly since 2014. Um, and that's good, I guess. We can start having that conversation. But you know, like you say, these platforms we've not held them to task, and we've not made it clear that we won't accept the way that these things happen. I mean, we've been fighting with Twitter for how many years now to try to get them to be a little bit more considerate about this. And it's still not worked. So no, I mean, obviously not. There's, you're not going to get a change because somebody gets mad. You're not going to find these people. Um, and if you find one of them, you don't even have the laws to be able to stop them from doing it anyway. So we don't have the laws in place. Yeah. Well, and that's one of the things, the issues here is I'm, I'm actually a little perplexed at how ridiculously naive some faculty are. Like, I mean, I, I'm not trying to dismiss the behavior of the idiots, right? The, the, this is a given. The, their behavior will be brilliantly idiotic because that's what they live for. I think my point is, like, where have you all been living that you haven't found that there's idiots online? Like, that, that's the part that, that surprises me that you're, you know, you're now shocked and you're calling for special commissions into behavior. Like, I look at some of the stuff, I'll just give an example, some of the stuff that, that uh, Audrey Waters, for example, has gone through, those of you who are familiar with her work, uh, you know, trying to really raise the profile of abuse that occurs in online settings from direct messages to, you know, direct assaults to whatever else. It's like, where have you all been that you think suddenly you realize 20 years after the internet started that there's idiots online and that your response to it is to call a special commission? I don't know. Well, I mean, at the, at the risk of, of being critical, um, this is the same as COVID-19, right? Suddenly we've got a disease. There have been other pandemics that have come through that have not gotten this kind of attention. This particular disease has a chance of affecting people in power more than other ones that have gone through and therefore it's getting more attention. The person you just described is a woman who has an opinion on the internet and therefore is somebody who gets attacked on a regular basis. And suddenly what we have is <gasps> men who are old and white who are being criticized and are getting attacked on the internet and that will suddenly draw attention to the issue. And I mean, I guess if that's what needs to happen, but I mean, I, I don't think this is the first time we've seen this pattern. Um, where suddenly, um, you know, uh, people are trying to do their work and, and they're being attacked. And to also be fair, a lot of the people who are coming onto the internet and being Zoom bombed now avoided the internet because they thought it was a cesspool and this has reinforced their beliefs in it. So to be fair to those people who have just come online and gone, what is even happening? Um, they avoided it in the first place and they've been forced to do this. So it's not like they asked for that process. But yes, yeah, exactly. um, 
Well, and, and I think this is some of the things, there are power dynamics that are at play here that exist in any kind of a setting. And I think the power dynamics is something that teachers experience as well. So let's say you go online for the first time. This is the kind of stuff we're talking about is, and we, we addressed this earlier in the course, I think in first week in the course, which is you have been, um, how do you put it? When you're engaged in a classroom, you have a ridiculous amount of control. And, and I think in some cases too much. Like I think it's fine sometimes for faculty to realize that, oh, wait a second, students have, an, have a voice and they have an opinion. So the difficulty here is you go to networks, you lose power. That's just networks distribute power the way that the system is architected and the platform is architected determines whether you have some means of taking it back. And obviously with the session that we have here today, yeah, we've locked things down for the time being at least. And I'm sure we'll learn something where somebody comes by and has a new and innovative way of doing something ridiculous and we'll have to try something else. But the point is when you go to teach in a network, you lose a lot of power. With that said, Dave, we can whine about Zoom bombing as long as we want, just because we're both hurt and traumatized. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit, though, about um, an article here I just dropped into the chat form, uh, which looked at ways of being together apart. And there's a lot of conversation going on about what happens when we sort of return to whatever normal is going to be. And I'll just be clear. I don't think there's going to be a return that's going to happen. Oh, I sent it to you privately to someone here. Um, let me drop it in again, sorry, Autumn. I don't think the return to normal is, is a function of weeks and months. The return to normal is a function of months and years. And so I think as a result of that perspective, it is worth starting to think in the way I've described it, it's the two hump problem, right? We've got the crisis right now, nothing matters. Anything you do right now doesn't matter. Just yeah. show attention to your students as best you can. Yeah. Try and nice. use the technology your institution has available, but trust me, nothing you're doing in the next six weeks to two months matters at all because everybody is trying to float. However, come September, things matter. And that's when you need to have a design process, you need to have a, a pedagogical model, you need to have a certain approach that's actually uh, interesting and focused and planned and the list goes on. So we're seeing this as a twofold stage. Currently, it's just stay alive but we need to start turning our attention to longer term planning. So this article here talks about exactly that. What happens when we get a return to classroom? So a number of questions they raise is, are we going to need to meet together physically for conferences as much as we did? We just moved the learning analytics conference online last week. And it's like, six, 700 people. Uh, it's our 10th anniversary of the conference. It was to be held in Germany. The conference was held 100% online and moved online in a period of 10 to 14 days. Now, in fairness, the people in the learning analytics field probably have a little more technical expertise. Uh, I saw the AERA literally canceled. They said, we're going online and then they canceled. And then I was talking to somebody and they said, well, yeah, but you know, they had a lot more people. Like they're dealing with 15,000 people rather than 500. And I'm like, that's true. But I just had a meeting with a group of presidents from Chinese uh, universities and they literally moved um, you know, in their, their one system, they moved 4,000 courses online in just over a week. And then you know how they train their team nationally? They had over 3 million faculty taking conference calls and courses to move online. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, the, their, what does the future look like come September, Dave? Tell us. Well, I think one of the first places, I love when you surprise that, and it surprised me with a question like that, and I've actually got an answer. Um, doesn't happen very often. So I think one of the things that we need to do right now is take specific use cases and sort of ask ourselves, not only what is it gonna look like, but what can we do, like with the face-to-face -face conferences, because let's face it, how many people are getting a better experience out of a face-to-face -face conference than what they would get if they actually read the articles, uh, listen to the videos that people did and engage with humans over the internet in that process. I mean, I enjoy going to conferences. I like to travel. I like to see my friends. Um, but is it actually a better like edge learning experience? I mean, some cases, there are some places, certainly I've had some wonderful experiences at conference over the years, but not like more than actually, you know, doing the work. When you look at a specific case, like first year courses and some at universities. So I've been in a couple of conversations now where people are like, well, how are we going to make sure that first year students have a great experience inside of first year course? And I'm like, oh, hold on a second here. Great experience compared to what? So if you're in a classroom of 500 people now, don't tell me somebody is having a foundational transformative learning experience. Are there beautiful lecturers out there? There are. That's true. It could be. But more, more often than not, we're not having that kind of transformative learning experience. So first, the current situation is not perfect. Do we need to have large 
large classes in order to maintain the current financial structure of higher ed? Yep, yeah, there's, there's no other way to fund it given what we've got right now. But how do we take a look at that first year class? If you've got seven 500 person classes in first year biology, how do we look at that in a totally different way that actually maybe improves that learning experience, gives you a chance to approach persistence, which when a first year class, persistence is a big issue, approach persistence from a different angle and maybe move all of the teaching assistance into student services and then think of support of first year classes less as an educational process and more as a student support process. I don't know. I'm just making this up right now. But yeah, I mean, because we're not going to bounce back. I think the big thing to, for people no. to sort of wrap their heads around early is there's no going back to exactly the way things were. Meaning even if by September, which trust me is not realistic, even if by September COVID magically disappears, as I've been told by leaders that it will, um, it's, it'll be like magic. It'll be gone. And so if that's the case, which it's not, then yeah, we'll get back to normal. But this is... A point I've tried to make before, I will say that the COVID discussion that we're in the middle of right now is going to have as traumatic an impact on the DNA of society as the Great Depression did, meaning that we're going to spend 20, 30, 40 years talking about this, and it's going to influence our policies, it's going to influence government regulations, and the list goes on. What I'm trying to get at with that is when it comes to universities, there are students right now who are having horrible digital learning experiences. I, I just had a, a call with a, with a student last week that was just baffled, lost, and confused. Now, all the student necessarily needed to do was dive in and, and follow the course announcements, but if you don't know exactly where to go, if you miss one little piece that puts the whole puzzle into place, you're completely confused because you haven't been in this environment. Now, you've got faculty who've been forced to teach online for a number of months, when they come back, they may say, you know what, yeah, okay, we're gonna go back to physical teaching, but guess what, I'm gonna take one course, one class a week, and we're gonna do it in Microsoft Teams, or we're gonna do one lecture a week in Zoom, or something comparable. So what I'm trying to get at is, the university sector is going to be irreparably changed as a result of this current cycle, even though we may not feel it right now, but you've had the greatest onlining in history going on, and I think that produces uh, sustained impact. With that, drop a link I in there. The, okay, I go think ahead. The online, I'm not done. I think the onlining. No, no, I think you should be done. I am not done, sir. I think the onlining is important. I think also the fact that suddenly what we've got is all the faculty doing the same thing. Like literally, when is the last time that everyone inside of a university has all done the same thing before? The answer to that question is never, except go home maybe. But right now what we've got is, I mean, the number of times I've been in conversations over the last 20 years where you walk in and they're like, oh no, we're not going to be able to have that conversation with the faculty. Not even having it, like not even introduced, but just, no, we can't do that kind of thing. It's not possible to get everybody to do the same thing. And now suddenly we're all doing the same thing. I think that breach in protocol is just as important as the rest of it. Because suddenly we're going to start going, well, we got to make emergency decisions. Now there's a danger there. And certainly there's a real danger of us losing the pieces of higher ed that we care about. But at the same time, there's a chance maybe in, in cases, and again, I, I spent a lot of time with first year students who have a particular passion for this issue, but to maybe make that first year issue question something that we could, I don't know, turn into a nice experience, that'd be good. Yeah, see, I think here's one of the difficulties here. Like I, so first of all, um, I actually blame faculty and administration for much of the current problem that we're in, meaning I, I, so I've seen a number of universities that have gone very heavily with online course providers and they play a role, but I've seen universities that have given up a ridiculous amount of revenue and in the process, a ridiculous amount of competencies. They haven't built their competencies because they've said, hey, company X, why don't you come in and take this percentage of our tuition and develop our online courses? So it sounds terrible to say, but in some cases, some of the universities that failed to develop this infrastructure, they created their own environment. They created the situation they face right now because of failed leadership faculty who literally, I mean, if you haven't taught online before, if you haven't taught in an LMS before, if you haven't been in a Zoom meeting or on in a number of environments online, like, what have you been doing? Like, the entire world around you moved online over the last 25 years, and you felt that sitting and lecturing in a classroom is the future? Like, so at some level, I just want to make sure that we also publicly shame and ridicule the people that should have had their crap together 
and didn't. So it's not just administrators, it is faculty as well. And there's a few, you see systems that have really innovative, forward thinking people that have been pushing this. And now one of the, the lectures or the videos that some of you in the course have seen this week was Maha Bali talking about her experience. So there's an individual of somebody who, you know, and I know Autumn and, and you and her have done a significant amount of, of work together, but this is an example of an individual who has uh, been in an environment like Egypt is not a hotbed of uh, web 2.0 e type of technologies, but it's someone who saw this as a thing that matters. Technology is going forward and actively integrated in her teaching practices, actively became a champion and a mentor online to help others get into that space. So not everybody is going to be Maha, but for crying out loud, figure out how a threaded discussion works in say 2007. So I, you know, on the one hand, I have a lot of respect for the crisis situation we're all in, but at some point we also got to say, this wasn't foisted upon us. People who've actually engaged with these trends over time are better prepared. But anyway, should we switch Dave? Because I'm fine. My blood pressure is rising. I'm going to start raging about how anybody that didn't engage with MOOCs is significantly behind the technology curve. Oh God, um, if only I've heard that be... argument before. Yeah, it was well received by a lot of people online, especially I saw that. In I saw Canada. That. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Um, did you pop another link in here, George? Well, Dave, that's good of you to ask. Yes, I. What did. is it that you'd like to talk about now? Well, this is a little more American centric, but it's worth emphasizing. Um, universities are. Um, I have a uh, a colleague that I interact with frequently who refers to uh, the trough of higher education. And so in the U.S., some of you may or may not be aware of this, but if you get a grant, you're likely going to lose between 50 to 60% of your grant dollars to indirects in the university. So if you get a million dollar grant, if you're at a place like Stanford, for example, 600,000 will go to the university uh, indirects for supporting the university system and the list goes on. Uh, the way the tuitions have gone on, you might have seen the dancing dean this last week, the losing my religion dancing dean out of NYU. She's my favorite. Uh, they pay 60, I'll drop a link in later, $60,000 in tuition a year. And she says, no, you don't get your tuition back. But here's a video of me doing an interpretive dance thing to REM's Losing My Religion. Hope you're doing well. Uh, so I'll drop that link in. It's one of my favorite things because humans are ridiculous. So universities are going to face a cash crunch or they're going to face significant economic challenges within the next year or two. Because of our budget cycle, we're a little bit behind the curve of other systems in society. In 2008, when the financial crisis hit, it wasn't really till 2009 or 2010 that things really sort of went south, um, you know, budget wise. And it's only in the last two years that in the U.S., states have started to rebound and support their funding back for the university, the university sector. We're not going to be getting back from this, you know, in less than five years, we're going to see long term sustained impact. Alberta has already cut massively to the university sector. University of Alberta is losing a 1000 positions. That was even before COVID hit. So any thoughts on sort of the longer term financial implications of this? And what does this mean to university sector? Yeah, we were talking about that today. So I mean, there's a couple of pieces that come in there. So a lot of the research that ends up at higher ed comes out of the big 10 universities from wherever and oh my God, they're getting, they're losing the funding that they have. But for the rank and file, for the rest of us, I think the bigger issue is that what we've been selling to governments for the last five or six or seven years, 10 years, is that we're somehow going to be preparing people for the workforce. And for those of us who've been connected to that conversation, it's not true. Um, we're not able to do that because what the government actually wants is we have 472 jobs that have just come in and we want you to train the people to go and do that job. And universities just are literally not built to do that. Like we can't. And you know, for a person taking a university degree, even if it is a professionally focused degree, one of those degrees that maybe don't belong in our traditional understanding of university, like teachers, um, then at least the way we train teachers, which is rote and disgusting, but whatever. So those people are not going to be able to be trained in anything under seven to eight to 10 years until they're professionals in a way that universities think of professionalism, but government wants it in six months, right? So the model has never made sense. So we're finally going to figure out, we finally, I think mostly figured out that that doesn't work. And so I don't know that there are, is going to be any consistency inside of government's understanding what universities are actually for. And increasingly, even those people who kind of think that universities are for something that's indirect and really important are, making, are finding it harder to make that argument 
to people that that's why they're giving away hundreds of millions of dollars to universities to keep them open. Because if you're in a position where governments are going to be overspending right now by 20% of their budget to sort of deal with the COVID-19 fallout, somebody's going to be going along through these budgets like they already have here in Ontario, like they did in Alberta already, because these cuts are are COVID-19 cuts, they're pre-COVID-19 cuts. And they're going to look at this again and go, eh, do we even really need this? Like, is this something we're actually using? And I think that what we're going to see is a huge shrinking of the university structure because there's no way for it to hang on the way that it's built. I'm not saying that the way it's built is bad. I'm saying that we simply, given the, the current discourse in our culture, we yeah. don't have a business case for higher ed that we can use that's going to compete with um, the things that it should be competing with, which is medical and K-12 education, and the things it will be competing with, which is grants for big business and whatever, right? So I, I don't know what the model is that we're going to use now, right? I mean, look at just, just the cost of buildings inside of higher ed, right? If you look at any university, in, like a, I'm not, again, I'm not talking about Harvard or MIT or whatever, but a normal university, quote unquote, like a mid-range university, the cost of their buildings alone inside, it's hundreds of millions, a billion dollars inside of a regular city, right? You're standing up a massive amount of infrastructure. And then for the last eight months, we just showed that we could do it all online. You know, and, and so there's an interesting question because for the vast majority of us, for the vast majority of our students, they, uh, the best definition I've, I've heard is that the intent of higher education is for us to be uh, publicly useful and privately happy. Um, you know, in terms of that's the role that's supposed to be like, we contribute to a society, we contribute to a democracy. There's, but for most people, like they go to university not to be enlightened necessarily, even though that's often a byproduct of it or some level of enlightenment. Um, they go to university to get a job. Like, you, you know, you're, you're that's well, in, in some cases you go to drink excessively and then to get a job after the drinking excessively has worn off as a novelty. But th that is a part of the experience. So I think at a certain stage, you need to realize our system and we need to realize and we've seen this for a long period of time. There has been an unbundling. There has been tremendously successful outputs of people going into various sectors without universities because universities are slow. They are clunky. They are. Uh, they don't respond. I've, I've said this frequently. Fifty-nine percent of the people. This is a Kaggle survey that is a couple years old now. But fifty-nine percent of the people that working in data science fields did their education through MOOCs or through self-study. The biggest, hottest field, fastest growing areas of employment, highest starting salary. Where were the university? They were literally six, seven years late to that party. So I just got approval. I've spent four years now, likely, uh, getting the, uh, yeah, I'll drop the Kaggle survey in there, Dave. That's that's not me. Google 59% MOOCs Kaggle data science and keep adding words until you get it. At, at the end of Penn, George is a really nice guy. I don't know if that'll contribute to the research, but it's more reinforcement learning. So if you look at this, we spent this time trying to get a Master of Science in Learning Analytics going. I, you know where that, the first conference, Dave, in, in the Learning Analytics event at Banff, 10 years ago, we just got a Master's of Science approved in Learning Analytics to launch and fall at UTA. You it's not that we weren't not, trying. It's that the system not was something so he made up. I was at that meeting. I remember him saying, okay, so we'll get this started up. We'll be ready by next year. Literally what he said at the time. So that's yeah. not four years. That's uh, 10. Yeah, that's I know. 10 years. Yeah. And, and that's a function of the university sector. So it moves slow, it's clunky, and that's why a lot of systems have already unbundled and moved around the university for high employment areas, which for universities is a significant loss of revenue. Now they're trying to backfill by offering data science and massive data science programs. But it's worth looking at, in some ways, the, the university sector, I believe, I agree with you, it will inevitably shrink by, simply by, as a byproduct of the amount of individuals that are turning their attention to employment-based focus, which let's face it, our entire social discourse has changed. There's a lot less talk and, and whatever you think about this, there, the, a lot of the, the social justice issues have taken a backseat because we have a hierarchy in a society. Am I eating? Yes or no. 
Two, do I have toilet paper? Yes or no? And once I've addressed a few of these, eventually you get to, do I care about others around me and are they also eating and have toilet paper? There's a lot of people who are now at, they've really shifted down to a basic lens. And final point on this, I used to have a colleague, she did a lot of work in Africa. And so somebody was at one point being critical of animal rights uh, concerns in, in Africa. And she said, her response was perfect. And she said, when you're worried about what you're eating, you're not focused on what animals around you are eating. Like it's, it's your, there's a priority here. It is a uniquely privileged Western view within universities where we can make this kind of a statement that we care about X, Y, and Z when there are people out there who are focused on fundamental life and death situation, which changes the conversation. Right, and I, I just want to address a comment in the chat room about, so how do we make it, ourselves relevant? Um, the path between here and there is not a short one, um, but I mean, if you just look fundamentally at the way the university is actually already currently built, you know, so if you think of the one-third, one-third, one-third teaching research service part, that's part of how we understand universities to be. And if we imagined every faculty member who makes $200,000 a year spending one-third of their time actually providing service to their community, I think those kinds of things would be fantastic starts, right? Because the service to the community piece, like if every time um, the local city government was trying to make a decision about the water and they automatically called the university because that's the relationship they have and the university is automatically doing that work, uh, not necessarily as an only consultant, I'm not suggesting everything should be public business in that sense. I mean, there are private companies who do work, but those private companies have a vested interest in selling you something. And if the university doesn't have a vested interest in selling you something, and they're there to provide a service to the community on knowledge, which you'd like to think was what the university is for, then that yes. provides a, like a, a real backdrop, a real sort of trusted resource that you can turn to at times of crisis to give you a second opinion about that. So there's, there's a really simple space, I think, where um, you would have to hold people to task for doing their service. Uh, because unfortunately we think of service as being on campus meetings, which seems yeah. moronic to me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let me turn a little bit to a final point uh, that I just want to identify, which is the role of universities in supporting the transition that a number of regions are doing. So I just want to share uh, a few quick things here. Um, one is we've got some interests, uh, and I'm surprised, and I, I'd like to hear, Dave, if this is happening in the, in the last couple of minutes, if this is happening out at your shop, but this is an illustration of a university that basically says to the uh, higher ed, this is from a colleague, Shane Dawson, that says to the higher ed sector in Australia, like, hey, if you guys want to, um, if you need help getting online, we'll help you. And then secondly, this is one of the first things I've seen, but uh, University of South Australia actually created a, whatever you want to call it, a $10 million fund specifically to support students, it, it, knowing that there's a number of challenges that they're facing. This is the first I've seen with that kind of a significant investment from, I mean, Harvard, they're busy kicking people out of dorms. Uh, MIT says, you know, go away, you know, until this thing is done. So uh, seeing universities do this is interesting. So what I like here is universities actually being useful to the school sector as they're moving online and secondly to their own students with this kind of big funding initiative. Well, it's funny you say that. I'm a little biased in this regard, but there's somebody in my house who just is in the news right now because that's exactly what she's trying to do. So Bonnie Stewart, who is my partner. Did she give $10 million, um, Dave? She did not. No, the first half of the argument, not the second half. I won't let oh, her give away her $10 million. Right, um, letter as if I have a choice in the matter. Um, but she, I can't find the link right now. Autumn, would you, you probably, can you find that link for me in the Windsor Star? Um, so she was just uh, in the Windsor Star, which is our local newspaper here a couple of days ago, talking about the university providing videos that help people, help parents be able to, um, and K-12 teachers be able to decide between the different tools that they can use with their kids, which ones are safe, what happens with their data and that kind of stuff. So the short videos that Bonnie actually designed before this process started, they've been sold as things that are being released now, which is fine, not by a university, actually just by the local newspaper. Um, but those kinds of things, those are public service things, right? That's open education for years has been to, uh, to, to many of us, a process of doing that kind of public service, of doing that stuff openly. And there are bits and pieces of that in different places, but I mean, you'd like to think that the K-12 system would automatically turn to the people who had taught them 
in these times of crisis. But the fact is, is that our faculties of education, I'm not speaking about the one here, the faculties of education are not full are full of people who are proper teachers. So they all had their teaching certificate. They all went to school and taught in a classroom for the most part, and then have not been in a school for 25 years and have been inside of a university, which is why I say that our current models of teaching schools are, are college-based, but living in a university. So like, like at a community college, you take somebody out of the workforce who was good at that, and then you take them in and get them to teach. But then we lose what happens in a community college, which is they go back out and work again, and then come back and go back out and work again and come back. Whereas in our case, you might teach for seven or eight years, you get a PhD, and then you go inside of a university classroom and you never go into a K-12 classroom again. So you can't actually reach back to the university for that information because many of them have not lived in the current school system and the school system now basically doesn't look like it, what it did 20 years ago. Like it was yeah. fundamentally different. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't know how relevant well, a lot of those people still are as I get the point that I'm making. Yeah, and, and I think it, it's a fantastic point. And I think the system itself is not really aligned for longer term service to society. It's aligned for service in the 17 to, to 23 year age group often. Um, on that note, I'm going to end here because we want to keep these things to about 30 minutes. We're going to be back for this exciting and witty repartee on Thursday. Dave promises he'll have a more engaging personality by that time. I'm confident. So try to be better. I'll to try that. to do better, George. I'll try to do better. No, no, it's, it's Dave. This is a chaotic time. You're doing the best you can, and the best you can is enough. <laughs> And go Google Stuart Smalley, video, uh, Smalley videos and now. The, the Stuart, the, the, the link to the video was kindly put in there by Adam in the chat room. So there is that link that, to the work that Bonnie's right. done here. All right. Thanks, I'll take care. Hope you have a good rest it. of your day. See you.